Monday, March 25th, and we have such a good show for you. I say we because I've got a guest on today's show who I'm going to bring up in just a moment, Aliza Rosen. She's the producer of Queen of the Con podcast series, but she's also really just like one of my text buddies. We text about all these shows. So when we watch Buying Beverly Hills basically together, not really, but together, we were like, we got to chat. So I can't wait to bring her up in a bit. But today's show is filled with some crazy casting news. We got a lot of changes, a new home being purchased that we've all been waiting for for a long time time, uh, some crazy gossipy rumors going on, and a really interesting night at Luann's show here at the Wiltern on Friday night. I'm going to get into it all in just a moment. Here is Daily Dose of Donna. I see your comments. Welcome to the show, everyone. It's a gorgeous day here in Los Angeles. Sunny, beautiful. It's literally, it gives me life. And of course, I'm back in the jungle. If you're watching the show on YouTube, of course, I have my jungle background. I'm going to get into the show in just a moment. But before we do, I want to remind you guys to subscribe. Thank you all for your new subscriptions. I appreciate you on YouTube. And then, of course, on Patreon. This week, we're going to do a YouTube only just for Patreon, plus some extra episodes and a happy hour next week. As we, a lot of you guys are on spring break this week. We do a late spring break at my school, but let's like get into spring, summer. These are happy times. And speaking of happy times, I want to shout out my favorite sock company, Dr. Motion. Dr. Motion Socks are the, uh, they're, they're sponsoring the show again this week. And I'm so happy about it because you guys, I'm wearing knee high socks like all the time now. If you are an athletic person, if you like to move your body a lot, walk a lot, maybe, you know, I have a lot of nurses that listen to my show. I got some DMs, shout out nurses, teachers, anyone out there, dog walkers that are constantly moving their bodies. Dr. Motion is a wellness brand that makes socks that exist to support and enhance their customers' everyday lives with comfort and wellness as evidenced by their constantly expanding lines of compression socks, compression tights, and diabetic socks. So consider using compression socks. You don't have to have diabetes diabetes or anything like that, or you you could be pregnant. You could just want to have a little bit uh, more circulation and all kinds of, you know, health in your lower region. That just sounds, you know, that's what she said. But make sure to check out drmotionsocks.com and check out all their products, explore their new collection. They have a really cute spring summer collection. And I wear their socks now. I wear them all weekend long. I'm telling you, I am a fan. So thank you, Dr. Motion Socks. All right, you guys, we are going to bring up my guest, everyone, Aliza Rosen. She is a producer. She works on podcasts. She works on a variety of uh, pr- programs. Remember, I'm like an old woman that wears compression socks and says I watch my stories and my programs. And she's a good friend of mine, Aliza Rosen. Welcome to the show. Hello, Donna. Hello, dosers. Yay. Aliza, Aliza texts me almost every single afternoon saying, oh my God, I totally agree with what you're saying about this. I, I have a, I, I think what you should say about this is like, we are in on this, in this world. We are connected. I know. We share a brain. I I never disagree with you. And I love your community. You have a great, I'm part of it. I love it. You are, you are. And and honestly, you have a quite quite a big background in this world. Number one, you had a podcast talking about the reality of reality, correct? I did. I did that for five years where I interviewed people in unscripted, like heavy hitters um, that have been producing and, you know, and very, all various aspects of it. And then at some point I kind of got into more pop culture and interviewed a lot of housewives and you were at Kyle's house. I was at Kyle's house right after the robbery, like soon after. And she was considering moving. I don't know if you guys remember that, where she was so freaked out to be in that house. Well, she had just moved in when the robbery happened, right? Like, wasn't it really soon after? Yeah. Yeah. So it was like in that first year when she moved there. Scary. Um, yeah, beautiful home though. And so um, Mark says, I feel left out. I have no trees, plants, or leaves on our wall. <laughs> yeah, I mean, when I s- first jumped on FaceTime with Elisa, I was like, your wallpaper one-ups my wallpaper. Um, I'm sure you didn't peel your own on, peel and stick from Target. Yours looks a little bit more fancy. 
I don't mess with DIY. I am not good at anything like that. But I will say I had, I, you know, I must have known the pandemic was coming because I had this done a year before. And then, of course, I was this was my background, you know, every day when the lockdown happened. So it worked oh, out. Well, it looks it looks really good. So before we get into it, I just want to throw out the fact that Queen of the Con season four. Five. Five. Season five. Tell us, it just got released last week, correct? And I saw, yeah. I started listening to it last night. It's so good. Explain what Queen of the Con, Con is and then what the season is all about. Sure. So Queen of the Con started um, in 2020, I believe. Season one was called The Irish Era. So my uh, partner in crime, literally, Jonathan Walton, was unfortunately scammed by this woman, Mayor Smith. Um, I believe back in 2017 that, you know, she groomed him to be his best friend and ended up sort of during, doing a long con on him and, and stole over a hundred thousand dollars from him. And he was so outraged and betrayed that he started, started on this odyssey to bring her to justice. And he uncovered, you know, scores of victims in the process everywhere, all around the country and in Northern Ireland. Um, and if you guys are up on the news, she's actually facing extradition finally to Northern Ireland for running a mortgage scam. Oh my God. A long time ago, 15 years ago. Um, so that's how it started. How, how it's going is we're now in season five. Um, the current season, like you said, just dropped last week, started dropping last week with our first two episodes and it's called the athlete whisperer. And it's this woman, Peggy Fulford, who was a money manager and kind of a general manager, but mostly with money to very, very powerful athletes um, like Dennis Rodman and Ricky Williams and was just so nefarious, stole millions and millions of dollars while kind of being a mother figure, sister figure to them. And um, I'll let you guys listen to see how it unfolded, but it's a really, really good one. And, and I think you'll be entranced. So, yeah, I mean, season one was about this Mayor Smith woman. Season two was... Season two was Lizzie Mulder in OC. We called her um, the savior. Um, uh, oh my God. Uh, the savior of OC. The uh, oh Whatever. Like, <laughs> I know. I'm like, how am I forgetting the name of it? But it was Lizzie Mulder. I thought she Alexis was, Polino was the savior of OC. Oh, I know. Well, Lizzie Mulder, you know, we always kind of like do a play on what they purported to be, right? So Peggy, the athlete whisperer, she did have a way with these athletes. And Mayor Smith said she was an Irish heiress. Obviously she wasn't. So Lizzie claimed to be the savior to all these small companies um, in Orange County. And she was like a housewife of Orange County. She had a husband, little kids, and she was just stealing all their money. Really, really horrible. Third season was incredible. This woman, Danielle Miller. Um, if you guys have seen the Hulu series, The Age of Influence, it's she's Ooh. one of the episodes. I highly recommend it. Um, she was, oh my gosh, um, you know, kind of, like we start the first episode with her recovering from a BBL and agents swarming her apartment in Pentas apartment in Miami, arresting her. Uh, she's a, she's a piece of work and a very interesting story because of her background. Um, not somebody you think would become, uh, a, a con artist. Thank you, Debbie. I'm glad that you uh, that listened to Danielle Miller. Um, yeah. and, and then the four was, season huge, four yes. was Jen Shaw. We had world. to, we had to. Yeah. Um, she, Jen Shaw was season four. That was incredible. Obviously. Um, and then this, this season is going to be so good. So it, new episodes release how often? Every Thursday, um, we've got eight episodes and they get juicier and juicier as they go, I will say. So everyone, thank you in advance for subscribing and listening. We appreciate it. It keeps getting renewed because we have such great, um, listeners and people are just love, love the ride. It's always, Jonathan does an incredible job of weaving the story through the twists and turns and leaving people on the edge of their seats. So I'm really excited about it. And I think you guys will love it. Yay. I mean, there's nothing better than like hearing about some con artists when it doesn't have anything to do with you. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. I feel like, I feel, do you guys get like submissions for people that they're like, you got to do a series about this person? Yeah. I mean, I have another series that's going to drop soon. Um, it was announced so I could talk about it with Alex Baskin, um, about this guy, David Bloom in LA, who's, uh, he scammed tons of people. One of them was Caroline DeMore, who's also kind of in our work. She was on the Hill. The pizza right? girl, the pizza girl. So and a huge Jewish advocate. I love her. He's been incredible, incredible. And so Alex actually reached out to me like, Hey, this would be a good con story. And so that's how that started. And then we ended up partnering with Caroline too. So that's going to be called Once Upon a Con, and it's going to be out on iHeart soon. I'm not sure exactly Stop. when yet. Yeah, so that's its own So series. David Bloom, B-L-O-O-M? Yeah. Or B-L-U-M? 
No, David Bloom, B L O O. And he conned a lot of these people out. Yeah, of his whole thing was like, there's an, a, you know, kind of like the Bernie Madoff, like there's this amazing IPO happening. I need $10,000. And then their friends would get them $10,000 and so on and so on. And, you know, he lived in the Villa Carlotta, which was this like fancy um, uh, apartment building where like, you know, they had a lot of celebrities had lived. So that's what they do. They insinuate themselves into your lives by pretending they're one of you. Yeah. And then you feel comfortable, right? They're not like some poor panhandler on the street. They're like living the high life. So you just, it's LA too. So you never know who's real and who's not, right? Totally. It really, I mean, of course the goal is for them to get you to trust them, right? So like they're going to be a certain way and just kind of be agreeable and be like the best person for you to talk to and become your oh my gosh, I can't do anything without this person. And then they, I mean, we hear this story all the time. We see versions of it on reality TV. You know, it's interesting. I think, okay, so Queen of the Con, you guys check it out. Make sure to subscribe to this new season and listen, like it's great listening for all the previous seasons and then uh, check out your new one. So you mentioned Alex Baskin just now. You're friends with Alex. Obviously you guys have worked together, Um, but he, but you don't have like uh the inner workings on what's really happening back there. And do you think Alex Baskin is is in line to become the next Andy Cohen? We haven't I, really talked about that. I know. That's your theory. First of all, no, Alex is a steel trap. He's amazing. Like he is, I always say, you know, like he, he could he could run for president. He's so good at keeping secrets, playing down the line, you know, kind of not uh, upsetting the apple car. Cause that's his job, right? That's how he keeps everybody's trust. And he's really, really good at it. So unfortunately I rarely get any good tea up from the inside, but he is an incredible producer. Um, and just so smart about the business. Do I think he's in line to be Andy Cohen? You know, I don't know, Donna, like, I don't think he wants that. Maybe, um, maybe he does. He's never expressed it to me. I think he kind of fell into it. Um, I think, you know, he, I had him on my podcast a lot. He always enjoyed coming on, um, and he's done, and he has, the, he's the host of the Bravo. Hot yeah. So that did, that didn't totally surprise me. I think it's part of sort of him building out his new company and creating a new empire for himself. That's not part of evolution. Cause obviously he was not the founder of evolution. He's the founder of his new company, 32 Which flavors, 32 flavors. And, and I found this out that Alex Baskin, Baskin Robbins heir, correct? Yeah, I wouldn't call him an heir. I mean, it's his uncle, I think, and his grandfather. But I don't think it's like his direct, you know, his father was a writer in Hollywood. He didn't go into the business. So I'm not sure it's correct to call him an heir. He seems to make it like it's 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 more of a loose connection, but it is the same Baskin. The question is, does he get free ice cream when he goes to Baskin Robbins? That's what I want to (laughs) know. I know. I need to know that, too. Uh, My last name is Krispy Kreme. So (laughs) I'm Donna Krispy Kreme Bowling. And um, I get free bowling whenever I go to pins. And then I, <laughs> um, okay, so so much we can talk about. Well, before we get into buying Beverly Hills and all of that, let's just talk about some stuff that happened over the weekend. Um, huge news: Ariana Maddox has purchased her own home. She's finally moving out, you guys. She's finally getting out. Now we don't know, and you tell me if you've read anything separately, but I have not seen any. Um, you know, information on what the status is of her and Tom's shared home. Have you? No, which is why I'm so, I mean, look, 1.6 million is not shabby. Like you have to have some scratch to come up with that down payment, right? That's like a $200,000 down payment. So pretty incredible that she's able to, you know, with someone who had like $5 in her bank account before Scandival is now able to not have the Valley Village home sold yet still able to come up with the down payment in this market for that home, which is gorgeous, sold by Ben Balak. I love that. Okay, so that's funny. I was going to say that. So this house is a $1.6 million house in the Hollywood Hills, and it's, you know, got a really great vibe if you're into that kind of modern vibe and a great view. It's different than the Valley. She's getting out of the Valley, but she bought it from her her agent who helped her buy it is Ben Balak, who is also, is it Balak? Ben Balak. What is it? What is he? Uh, what do they call him? Beverly Hills Super Realtor. <laughs> That's ben Bellack, Beverly Hills Super Realtor. He is one of the stars of buying Beverly Hills. So he helped her purchase that home. It's a great crossover. I know. I love it. In fact, the funny thing is, because I'm such a loser, I w- before it was even announced that he was, I went on, clicked on the listing and saw it was Ben. And I was like, oh my God, what a crossover. And then everybody picked it up. I was like, this is amazing. 
Oh but my I mean, God. you it's- know, LA, it's a small town. I mean, even when we drive around in the Valley, you'll see Josh Altman's listings. You'll see the two British guys listings. You'll see, you know, I mean, like, it's not so crazy that Ben sold that house. No, I see their names everywhere. Like yeah. all of these, I mean, well, we, we're going to talk about Beverly Hills, buying Beverly Hills, you know, Michelle, who is the villain on the show. I can't wait to talk about this. Oy. She's a she's a friend of mine. I went to high school with her and I have a lot of thoughts, but, um, and then I saw Zach from um, the show as well at Whole Foods yesterday. So you see these names everywhere. It's true. Josh Flagg's name is on so many signs, the Altman's exactly. Um, okay, so I'm happy for her that she bought the house. I'm interested. I had a weird feeling that she was going to like try to move to New York, but Oh, interesting. Yeah, I did have a friend. Yeah, I don't know. I think she realizes ultimately Chicago is going to have its run. And then really, what are the opportunities? Like the theater life is not easy after that, you know, and then the really the heart of the industry is here. So I don't know that that totally surprised me. What do you think? Like, if you could guess what Ariana's next move is, what do you think it is? I think she's going to try to do more. I was going to say movie of the week. I'm dating myself, but like more like Hallmark movies and Lifetime movies and maybe like the lower budget Netflix movies. Like I think she has a career as a working actor. Maybe she'll do, I could totally see her doing a Luann cabaret type thing. Remember there was, you know, I can't remember what season, but it was like in the first half of the seasons where she did that thing where she was reading her diary on stage. It was kind of like a groundlings type thing, but it wasn't groundlings. You know what I'm talking about? Yes, it was. Um, I totally know what you're talking about. It was like an indie LA theater thing where yeah. like they all read like their deep, dark secrets from like high school when they like had their vagina diary. monologues. Yeah. But it was like their high school diary. And yeah. she was, I remember she was really good then. I was like, Oh, this is a side of Ariana that we don't really see. So improv. Yeah. So I think she always wanted to be a comedian and an improv actress. Like this is the thing that was always so confusing because I don't, I still don't see her as a comedian. Like that doesn't, a line for me when I think of Ariana. Um, but she's always wanted to be a comedian. She just doesn't have like a comedian vibe to her, but she's talented. She's incredibly talented. It's obvious. She knows how to entertain a crowd. She's, she's, she can sing, she can dance. Um, she's beautiful. So I hope that she will, you know, continue to work hard. We'll see about something about her. There was a rumor that went around over the weekend about something about her. Well, that the reason that it's not opening up is that they don't have the name trademarked. And there's a rumor that the chef, Penny, is that her name? Penny? Patty? Who's the other woman that's on the show that was interviewing with them? Yeah, I don't remember her name, but I know who you're talking about. It was a top chef, I want to say. Oh, really? Uh, yeah, someone told me once that she was one of the top, she was on one of the top chefs. Anyway, Penny, thank you. Michelle says Penny and her husband own it all. So apparently Penny is now trying to kind of like get in there. And that's part of the reason that there's like a little bit of a holdup on this show. Um, she wants to be, I mean, on the on the sandwich, she wants to be a third part share partner now. And um the chef could be licensing it out, possibly. Okay, Michelle knows it all. Uh, Stick a fork in it, LLC. And apparently there's going to be these like pop-ups through Uber Eats, like a ghost kitchen pop-up that's going to show up in other cities, but it's out of Ariana and Katie's hands necessarily. It doesn't seem good. It seems like there's a lot of weird back and forth and behind the scenes stuff, which is interesting. Because did you guys notice on that episode of Vanderpump that when they were interviewing people, there was like a weird tension there? between Penny, right? Because she was interviewing and she was kind of taking over and they both, I felt like Katie and Ariana both were annoyed by it. Yeah. I I mean, honestly, something about her has been cursed from day one with all, I mean, remember when it was like opening and there was a storefront and like the yellow cute thing. And then like all of a sudden it wasn't, I mean, I just, I I mean, if we had a Penny for the amount of times Katie said opening. Her name is Penny. So that's, this is really funny that you're saying we have a quarter, but I mean, it's just, I don't, I love the idea of it um, because I love sandwiches, but I feel like it's a really hard concept to make work. Like in the Valley, I think it would kill it because it's cheaper real estate. I know. And I just feel like um, it's, I just feel like it would do better here. I mean, seriously, open up a booth at the farmer's market in Studio City. Are you kidding me? There would be a line down the block. Completely. 
Completely. Like so, that's honestly the next move for them is they should just, they should just, but now that Penny is involved and doing all this stuff, like there, it, it does seem like it's almost getting ahead. It's getting too big for them. Like it's almost like they should just start over and call it Ariana and Katie sandwich shop. So what do people do with all the merch they bought? <laughs> when well, that's the happened. problem is like the merch the everyone's very upset about the merch because so many people bought merch a year ago yeah. or almost a year ago because they were so supporting after Scandaval. And now they're starting to, you know, question like what is going on there? Hopefully it will get addressed in the season. I don't know. I mean, all we've heard is that there's been permit issues and someone pooped on the patio. That's all we've heard. <laughs> um, but Let this be a lesson. Do not buy any Jax's merch because God knows where Jax's will be. Someone sent me a picture of Jax's Studio City like from their Instagram and it was a picture. Well, number one, their Instagram. We need to like do a deep dive on Jax's Studio City's Instagram. This may <laughs> actually be a moment because... I cannot like some. We need someone to take over immediately. Like we have a problem with this, uh, with this Instagram. I want to ask you guys some something about Jax's. Now, Aliza and I both live exactly like we could walk there Walking if we wanted distance. to. If we wanted to be like, I, I'll drive, but we could walk Absolutely. there. Absolutely. We and, and you've been one. No, no, never. <laughs> I've never oh, been, I was I've supposed never been. to go and the, and the plan fell through. So this is why I'm joking with you that we should go for a Tuesday night watch party because I just want to see, I just want to see it. I know it's going to suck. By the way, they posted these shrimp. Um, this is what I want to show Did I send you. that to you? They look disgusting. This is what we need to talk about. If you're watching on YouTube. I will not eat there. I will I bring my you own guys, food. I need you guys to watch and just see some of this. Number one, I wouldn't, at a, like, Whoever's doing their Instagram is stuck in 2015. Like, what is this? Right? <laughs> These like crazy, they're just brochures, basically. Oh I want strip. you to look at this. Oh. And I want to ask you, <laughs> how much do you have to be paid to eat this? <laughs> and it's fine. Like, if you're making this beautiful uh, mozzarella, they call it a mozzarella stack. If you're making this at home, I am like down right but this is not an instagram worthy picture for a restaurant right no, i don't they know. need a they need a food designer that is, um, that is yeah not what about it. this guy no that's the one that i oh, oh, i did a vicky oh. <laughs> yeah i'm sorry and i love shrimp but no hell okay no. i i truly this looks like it's a brick it literally screams food poisoning to me. <laughs> okay. Then there was one other thing that I saw. I I, I need to like find it. It, it was, so it was unreal. Oh, it, I think it's just the main picture that they posted. So someone that doesn't live in Los Angeles, she listens to my show and she's a friend of mine on Instagram and she DM me and she goes, can they at least get a new roof? What's happening here? Oh, I didn't even notice that. It's so I bad. mean, it's an old. So for those of you guys that don't know about Jax's, it is an old business that is um, it's Rocco's right it's Rocco's it's like yeah. but the building itself has been around for a long time yeah. they just kind of reinvigorated the inside I think they peeled and stuck some wall wallpaper on like me but I do I, I we do have to go I know that they do Vanderpump rules viewings on Tuesday nights I'm gonna push it out there that maybe we go next Tuesday or the week after okay See you next Tuesday actually next, next Tuesday, Tuesday I'm gonna be in New York but I am down for the week after. two weeks let's go two weeks it's a date We'll it report live. We'll report live from Jax's. We will go live. And yeah, maybe, maybe we'll see Brittany Ariana's there. brother. Oh my God. That's another big story that happened. So over the weekend or last week, at some point they had an event probably for the Valley premiere. And I guess Ariana, Ariana's brother, Jeremy, who's been on Vanderpump multiple times, younger brother was there and he was interviewed on some sort of podcast live. I mean, it's called like the pump rules podcast. I don't even know. But he's essentially saying that he and Ariana do not talk, that she hasn't talked to him for months, and that clearly he's siding with Sandoval and that crew because he's hanging out at Jax's with Sandoval, and Sheena took a picture with him, which just makes me think that, like, now if Ariana's family is turning on her, that sucks. I was disgusted. First of all, I've never liked Jeremy. Sorry. I always got – remember there were, he – Went out with Billy and there was that whole scandal. Kastasi and I think Katie were like, he's a creep. And it became yes. a whole thing. And yes. Ariana was really pissed at them. Yes. I agree. I've always gotten a creepy vibe from him. He's a weirdo. Sorry. I love Ariana, but I'm sorry. No. 
And also to, to dime your sister out like that, that was so awful. Like no matter what exactly. happens, you, you cannot know. throw a no. sibling under the bus in a never. public way. I, I just, whenever I see stuff like that, like obviously we've seen it with the Richard sisters and we've seen it with the Judy, Judy cheese and we've seen it with, I mean, it's I feel like so when it's family, great. it's just. I, I went back. Um, after buying Beverly Hills and I went back to season one, episode one of, of Real Housewives of Beverly Hills. And I know you've been recapping it, but I just wanted to see like how Kyle was introduced on the show with Mauricio and the whole family. So I ended up watching like literally just fast forwarding to her scenes in the first episode. She was so mean to Kim and about Kim. It was, Beyond. I couldn't believe it. I actually was in shock. No, her relationship with Kim Richards is her relationship <laughs> with Sutton now. Oh, completely. It's it's you could literally just like insert blonde. It's worse. It's worse with Kim. I could not believe she's just like basically like my sister's a loser. I don't trust her to do anything. We take care of her. Kim, what are you thinking about? How dare you have try to have another baby? You're a mess of a person. It was like, whoa. No, it's one thing after another. And in the right. end of the season, at the end of the season is when she yells at her and, and says that she's an alcoholic on camera. If you just watch season one, Kyle was the villain in season one. Like there's no question, but it's yes. weird because, and Zach and I were talking about this on our rewatch. It's like, it's weird because we hated Camille so much. And I get that too. She comes off so unlikable. But actually, Taylor Armstrong is horrible season one. Kyle is horrible season one. I know. It was wild. Taylor looked great, though. I wasn't expecting that. Like, looking back, I was like, oh, there's her face. There's that face I remember her. I know. She's really yeah. overdone it since then, I think, with the, with the filler and stuff. But she's gorgeous season one. Okay, so... So I agree, Laura, of Kyle, Richardson. I just got a, a text message from um, from Ray and I want to share this. So Morgan posted some sort of video, I guess, Morgan Wade on her on her feed today. And I don't know, it looks like a video, but I can't watch the video because it's just a screenshot. And Kyle's comment says, save a horse, ride a cowgirl. Oh, my God. Yep. Holy shit. Save a horse, ride a cowgirl. So what's going on there with Morgan and Kyle? They're obviously having fun with each other. And obviously after watching here, I'll show you, I'll show you the, um, I, my jaws on the floor. Really? I mean, at this point, they're just effing with us. Like, right. Look, this is it. Save a horse. Kyle writes, save a horse, ride a cowgirl. This is from Celebrity Chronicles. It just came right up. Wow, oh, everyone is posting it. Bravo, OMG. I'm Kyle and Morgan are back on their bullshit. <laughs> Completely. I mean, are we, are we, do you really want to talk about these two? Are, I we, going, mean, are we going there? I think it's going to have to come up if we talk about yeah, uh, well, exactly. buying Beverly Hills. It's a big part of it, I feel like. Uh, it's not just, really a big part of it, actually, but we, we get so much more into Kyle and Morgan. I mean, Kyle in her life, I should say, on buying Beverly Hills. So why don't we just, um, uh, what do I do? Okay. Yeah, why don't we, we have just to do Potomac too, right? Do you I know. Potomac? Let's jump into buying Beverly Hills though. Okay. For anyone out there, did you guys watch buying Beverly Hills? I would love to hear in the comments. It's 10 episodes. It's so bingeable. Any show on Netflix I've decided is a bingeable show because it re it just goes right into the next one and you have no commercials. So even if you're trying to binge, like just say a Real Housewives season, usually you have to go through commercials if you record it or whatever. And then you have to like make sure, Netflix is genius. It just cuts off the credits. All of a sudden you're in the next episode. I know. So I watched 10 episodes in two days, maybe two and a half. You guys, a lot of you watched it too. Okay, I need to say something. I need to say something that is going to shock all of you. All of you. I like Mauricio again. I think I like, like I, Mauricio really came up for me from this show. Wow. 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 <laughs> wow. Bethany. Calm wow. Down, I mean, I look, this is the thing. I get it. Mauricio is a salesperson, Donna. So you are, he is a literal charmer, Timo. That is why, you know, this is, I think Ryan Bailey said it's, it's Real Housewives of Beverly Hills, Mauricio's version. A hundred percent. This is so, the Mauricio era. Yeah. So it's like, it's very interesting. There was a show on Showtime years ago called The Affair 
where it was told Rosh- yeah Rashomon style where they do his POV what's it called her, it, the Rashomon is like a it, it, it's when they describe like the same story from two people's point of view so by the way that is a genius way to do a show the affair completely. was so well done because it was of genius that. so okay. so it's kind of interesting if you look at it through that lens right because it's like you kind of have the same storyline going on and I I'm begging someone I'm not good at this stuff but like there are so many people out there to like literally line up the timeline of Beverly Hills filming and buying Beverly Hills filming and seeing where the intersection comes. Because for instance, when Kyle, when they're in the kitchen and Kyle's like, I'm going to Nashville to shoot a video. Like we know that's the video, right? And we know that was filmed in June. So like timeline wise, there's a lot of interesting stuff that I just, I'm not organized enough to figure out, but I know that basically by the way, I don't even need to know it by the calendar. I can tell by Kyle yeah. that she, this is, they're already separated in this too, right? Like they're, they're, they're faking it for the I cameras. I would say the first episode, and I don't know when they started shooting exactly, but the first episode is, is very much like, we're a unit. We're all together. Remember they go to that gorgeous open I house. Do, cause I do. Cause I rewatch, I rewatched all of the just Kyle scenes <laughs> after I finished. I know you guys, this is not, I'm not, I'm embarrassed. Okay. But we're I not, mean, we're, we're, I am we're not studying about like this, this at all. I know I am studying like this, but like, it's like I'm getting a PhD in Kyle and the Umansky. If only we took high school this seriously. I mean, if my daughter <laughs> studied this, like she could study math then we would be all doing better. So <laughs> you're I, right. Right. Okay. So I think that it, wasn't as bad, but she was already checked out. Like to me, well, yeah. We know, we definitely know that Kyle and and Morgan started becoming very close at the beginning of 2022 as friends. As yeah. well, even even if they just always were friends, that's when they started becoming friends. Exactly. Then she stopped drinking around June or July of 2022. So when this was being taped, this was in 2023 already. Yes. So this is a good solid six or six to 12 months of her and her lifestyle changing and all of this, all of these changes. So a hundred percent, that first scene was like, let's put on this happy family unit for buying Beverly Hills season opener. Well, and also remember the scene, I don't remember what episode it was in, but where there, it, it, it happens, um, when she's kind of getting ready for bed in her pajamas and he's telling her about the drama at work and Sophia coming into the office late, this is early. This is like episode two or three mm-hmm. and they get into bed. Uh, first of all, he's like, Oh, you look so pretty in your jammies. And he puts her, his hand on her leg. Again, I studied this. She does not put her hand out. She does not say thank you. She does not say, Oh, she just is like, eh. like you could tell she's recoiling. Then they get into bed. This is in quotes for anyone who's not watching. And he's like, Oh, you're going to read. And he, she, He's like, give me a kiss. She gives him a kiss. And then he's like, give me another one. She's like, oh, and she gives him her cheek. Remember? I mean, clearly they are not sleeping in the same bed. This was totally for the cameras, I think. But what's so interesting, Donna, and this is where I was dying to talk to you about this, is I I didn't think this with Beverly Hills. I thought they were they were lying when they said the kids didn't know. And I realize now the kids did not know. Okay, so this is a dynamic that I thought was insanely interesting to watch. And I truly, I'm telling you, I really could not wrap my head around this because I started the show season. Now, I watched season one like sparingly, like here and there. And I really didn't care so much about the daughters or anything. <laughs> but season two, now I'm so invested and I feel like I, I, like we're watching, you know, a thesis, right? So- I love Alexia. She is, I, to me, the most grounded, sw- like smartest, um, kind of like more even keeled one. Sophia's the younger one, not obviously as young as Portia, but she's the younger one. And at first she just seems very cold, but you find out that she's dealing with like major anxiety. And then Farah, of course, is she's a hard one to break, right? She's a little bit of a cold person. Zach mentions it best. Like she's an M&M, a peanut M&M. She says that he's, she's hard on the outside, then like chocolatey and soft, but then you hit a peanut. Like she's got a lot of obstacles there and she's an interesting one too. But then you start to realize these girls, and you find this out throughout the season, these girls legit knew nothing about their family and their family's dynamic. And honestly, 
what the F is wrong with Mo and Kyle that they did this to their daughters, that they left them in the dark over not only the marriage and the positive stuff and the, they never fought in front of their kids ever. How could that be? I know. I know. Okay. So we both watched Paris in Love and I am, I, I now want there to be like a whole psychological breakdown podcast about the Richard sisters and the family dynamics because Remember how even put it on Queen yeah. of the Con, right? <laughs> Queen of the Con, I know sisters. exactly. Remember how they both use the terms Farah, Alexia, and Sophia. We push things under the rug. We push things under the rug. Do you remember how many times that exact terminology came up with Paris and Nikki mm-hmm. about Kathy and the Richards? I think this is exactly how they were raised. And in fact, when I interviewed Kyle for my podcast way back when, and we talked about season one and her saying the thing about Kim being an alcoholic. I remember asking her something like, is that how you were raised? Were you raised to keep secrets? And she goes, well, isn't that how every, something she said something like, well, isn't that how all families are? And I kind of laugh. I said, not my family. I said, we are like over shares, you know, and it was really part of my family. Like, right. It was, so it's really too much. Exactly. It's very Jewish. And so it that was is. right. So not all, but, but a lot. So it was very revealing to me um, that, that is something that was ingrained in those Richard sisters and how they were raised and then how they raised their own kids because they all consider, I don't know about Kathy and her kids, but Kyle considers her daughters, her best friends. She is legitimately with those. Like, she did not have nannies raise those girls. Like not no, that they she didn't have a- help, but she was a hands-on mom who, you know, and I believe as a family unit, they were together. They did a million vacations. I mean, they have, Mauricio said at some point they had dinner on the table every night. I'm like, oh my God. I, I mean, I have dinner on the fa- uh, dinner on the table like once a year. So I was amazed by the fact that they talk, but they don't talk. So to me, and again, well, yeah, I can't share that on this. Okay. But I'll, I'll share offline something interesting about the girls knowing versus not knowing. Cause I have some feedback about that, but uh, I can't, I, it would reveal something else, but here's, yeah. here's my thing. My thing is, is that I didn't believe it until this show. I believe what they shared was, you know, because they could just tell they're not blind. Like mom and dad aren't spending any time together. They're, you know, whatever it was going on, they probably said dad and I are working through some stuff, but I believe they truly had no idea. I believe. And again, this is all alleged. It's my opinion, but I believe that Kyle, whether she herself leaked or approved the leakage of the people magazine story, I think that she thought it was just easier for the girls to find out that way. Not in a nefarious way, not in a way where she's not a good mom, but just this is the way that they deal with their stuff. She grew up in Hollywood. She plays, she's playing out the entire Morgan relationship and the Mauricio split through the tabloids. Mm -hmm. And I think it's just the way. And also I think she was in a fog and probably not even thinking about it, to be honest. Yeah. I think she was so afraid that she and Morgan were getting exposed as her cheating on Mauricio that she just panicked and said, fine, just leak it out that we're separated without prepping their daughter. It's really an interesting take on this, that, that instead of having to have this like because th- right when the People magazine was being leaked, which was when they were in Aspen for July 4th, it was right around that weekend. And right when it was getting leaked was when everyone was questioning her relationship with Morgan. And you're right. She cannot in any way be vilified as the bad person in this in this situation. So it's better just to say we're separated, but no, neither of us have done anything wrong. Do you remember that was her? Um, yes. That was her her like statement. She was like, we've both not done anything nefarious, but that seems to not be the case because in every interview she's saying, Mauricio did something to lose my trust. Mauricio did something to lose my trust. So if no one's done anything wrong in the marriage, you wouldn't say that. You would just say we've grown apart. Exactly. We love each other, but well, we've they grown apart. changed their story 50 times. So I have a new, a new theory on what happened in the timeline. So I think, and again, I don't know exactly when Lorene passed away, her best friend, but I think that Mauricio, and again, my opinion, allegedly, all of the caveats, I think that Mauricio cheated. I think that's the thing that he did to break her trust. I think it was bad, whatever it was, with someone she knew or whatever it was, it was a a final straw because I think she's alluded to, well, you know, it's things that were swept under the rug. You know, we had kids. I was breastfeeding today. So I think that he had cheated and they just didn't deal with it and they were happy and in love. And it just was like, all right, you fucked up, but that, oh, you screwed up. Sorry. That's okay. Um, but, uh, <laughs> so anyway, I think Lorene died 
Uh, remember she said that Lorene said to her, Kyle, like fight for your marriage. Don't give up on your marriage. So I think the cheating happened before Lorene died okay. and Kyle was thrown by it completely. And, you know, probably trying to work or on it or reeling from it. And by the way, I know that's what happened because Teddy basically confirmed it on her podcast and watch what happens live by saying, I know why Kyle's angry. I was so married. I was so angry at Edwin. I've never talked about this, but he had been cheating and you know, so yeah, no, a hundred percent. Clearly what happened. Yeah. For anyone that's out there saying Mauricio never cheated. Like, I don't think you're picking up on so many of the Easter eggs that have been dropped. Exactly. So I think what happened was the combination of Lorene dying and meeting Morgan at the pretty much exact same time was, I don't know that if she hadn't met Morgan, if they would still trying to be work, working on, if they were still trying to work on, if they would still be trying to work on their marriage. I think that Morgan came into her life at a time where she was dealing with this gut punch of Lorene on the heels of this big issue in their marriage with Maurice cheating, Mauricio cheating. And then not to mention, and I hate to, you know, throw back to, you know, he will never emotionally fulfill you know that, but this whole idea of your kids growing up and you're starting to deal with the reality of what that means with you and your husband in a home when it's quiet, like, and it's weird because when you watch buying Beverly Hills, like those girls live with them. Like they're they're It's not an empty mess nesting situation whatsoever. Both Alexia and Sophia who are over 18 still live at home and Alexia's boyfriend's always there. And of course, Portia's there. Poor Portia. Like seriously, where is Portia? I, She's I, not on this show. She had She's summer not. reading. She had summer reading. Oh my God, Portia. Like we saw her in Aspen poor thing for five minutes when she was like, oh my God. And did you notice that? This was a crazy scene. Wait, like I need to like stay on track and then go back to this. Okay. So, so Kyle obviously was in this moment, you know, I think you're right. It's like, it was like this house of cards. Like everything was kind of sweeping under the rug. Everything's fine with our marriage because this lifestyle affords me this wonderful, you know, life for my kids. I get this home. I get the 16 dogs. I get the travel and the jets and the, I mean, the perks that Mauricio's life comes with the fact that he has so much money and so much power in this world. He really does. You guys don't, I don't think you guys realize if you're not at least in Los Angeles, but he has so many offices around the world. Like everywhere you go, you get treated like royalty. If you're with Mauricio, I bet. So, I truly believe that you're right. Everything happened for a reason. Exactly. It like all fell in perfect place, perfect storm for her to say enough. I don't know if something specific happened, which is why Mauricio is so confused by it all. Well, because he's yeah. walking around like, huh? Because I still about the, the marriage. I know because I think, <laughs> I think what happened was she forgave him or like basically they got past whatever that was. And then I think it almost like the mask came down. Like she realized like, I, you know what? There's all these other things that don't work. Like he's an extrovert. I'm an introvert. He parties. I don't party anymore. Like all, you know, Morgan lives her life on her terms and Mauricio's a people pleaser and is always about the facade. And that was the way I was raised. And that's how Kathy, like, I think everything hit her at once in terms of like, I don't need, like, I don't have to stay with this person anymore. Like I have someone else. And by the way, whoever said that no one talks about their age difference. It's so true. Like it's, it's, why is it not like, it's so cringe is a good word. We'll just use the word cringe that it, and why is that never talked about and has never come up? I mean, because I'm sorry. it's not confirmed that they're together. I think but if it, they were confirmed that they were together, people would start to have more of a say, but like people can talk about Chris and Cavallari and a younger man and Nick Vile with a younger woman and all these other, you know, real housewives that are married to fit. Okay. And 50 years well, older. Let's say they're not together. We know they're together. What, are, what they are is together all the time, whether yeah. they're banging or not. I'm sorry. I think it's weird. Like if I was, I'm Kyle's age. Exactly. If I'm hanging out with, and my stepson is Morgan's age. If I'm having out, hanging out with a guy that's my stepson's age every day, going or a to girl or a girl, to girl or whoever I was saying, like, you know, uh, gallivanting around the world. It's weird. I'm sorry. My it kid, is weird. My, my daughter no. would be like, what are you doing, mom? Like, why are you hanging out with this person as your best friend? Like, I don't and that's get another, it. that's another thing about seeing the girls. So there's this one scene that they're in Aspen and this is the craziest scene you've ever seen with her biking up the hill <laughs> with the two Hermes bags and face reality 16. Da -da 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 that's like, that's like good. Witch, right? I love it's it. It's a genius, like cinematic moment. 
She comes up now immediately. She's like, don't show your dad the purchases, which is so weird to me at this stage in your life with all the money you have, you can't show your husband on TV and you're on TV, by the way, like there's cameras. So you're not hiding anything from your husband, but this whole like, don't. And then the girls are like, did you buy me something? And she's like, no. So Kyle is constantly shopping and getting dogs and now tattoos. Like she's constantly trying to fill Fill some hole something right that hole. Yeah. But you know, that's what she said. So anyway, (laughs) she, she's buying these, you know, these Hermes bags. And this is right juxtaposed with the scene that the girls are saying something's going on with mom and dad, but like, we don't really know. And they don't really talk to us. Then all of a sudden they're cooking. Mauricio is like, bless his heart. He's just a positive dude. And he's always trying to like, Hey, so like, what are you doing? What's going on? And maybe that is annoying to live with. Maybe it is annoying to be with someone that's not seeing things for what they are and just rose colored glasses always like everything's fine. Toxic positivity. And so in this scene, (laughs) they sit down to have their pasta and barbecue or whatever. And this is when Kyle mentions to her daughters. So I have to go back tomorrow because I have to reshoot for buying for Beverly Hills, for real housewives of Beverly Hills. The fact that this is being such an open conversation is breaking the fourth wall. It's breaking the seventh wall. I know. It's the craziest thing. I know. So she has a conversation with her and she basically says to her, I mean, to the girls, and she says, well, you know, because of the scandal, (laughs) can you imagine your mom saying to you about your dad and your marriage falling apart because of this scandal? Like what? I would be like, what is, are you guys together? Do you love each other? Mom, dad, hello? I know. I know. It's, bananas. And, it's, and Mauricio is like, wait, who are you shooting with? I'd like to know too. I know. I know. It is all, everything, they all, everything with them is subtext upon subtext. Upon, nobody says what they mean and means what they say. Have you noticed that? Like They have a different language. Ex- the, which is they don't speak about anything real. Like there's a scene with, um, I believe it's the last episode with um, Farah and Mauricio, or maybe not the last, where they're talking a little bit about their personal life. He asked her about her fiance. And he says, and this is where it's all bullshit BS because they can't get their story straight. So Mauricio is saying like, and the whole thing, it was on, it was on Beverly Hills too. Is it how busy, busy, busy. All we do is travel. We're both so busy, 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 busy. And he's like, you know, and basically then when we are together, it's really strained. And, and Farah goes, you mean when you're not together, it's strained. And he goes, well, yeah, you know what I mean? Yes. And, and I was like, oh, that was, he slipped up. I mean, yeah. it's not that they're, it's, it's, they can't be together. It's not the that fact they are is, apart. The fact is they're both incredibly busy. Sure. She's not too busy to go to every music festival in town, exactly. but whatever. It has nothing to do with that. They're not too busy. When you have money the way that they have money, exactly. you find a way to fly to each other and make it work if you are wanting to be there. If they wanted to, they would. They don't want to be there. And I think Mauricio is, it sounded to me like throughout the season, and maybe this is just editing or whatever, but it did sound to me throughout the season that he was kind of trying to in, in instigate a connection with her. He was trying to talk to her. Hey, do you want to hang in with me? Do you want to talk this and that? But she is shut off. She is done. She is done, 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 done. And we got kind of strung along on both shows. Well, mostly on, on Real Housewives. And this new season, it's, it's insanely sad to see that these girls found out with the rest of the world. That was such a flaw on Kyle and Mauricio's part. Well, mostly Kyle, because I don't really think Mauricio had any idea what was happening. And well, he still... I didn't know. have the ability to ask her, are you with okay. Morgan? Wayne? Okay. H- hold that thought for one second. In fact, we know it was on cut. Cause when that last scene, when they're all sitting outside eating and he said about, you know, your mom, uh, we're free to date. We're free to see who we are. And the girls were like, what? And he's like, Oh, oops. Sorry. I thought mom talked to you about this already. Like there is zero communication. And I have a theory of why he hasn't asked Kyle about Morgan. Two theories. One is that they do not communicate. Mm-hmm. And I mean, the second being, he doesn't want to know, obviously, because it's, that's painful. And mm-hmm. three, I think it's because he doesn't want to bring back up his affairs. So I think it's like, if he opens that, oh, okay. You want to talk about more again? Let's talk about this one. Let's talk about that. So it's like, I'm not going to poke that bear. It's fine. Whatever. Like don't ask, don't tell. Exactly. The craziest dynamic in a 27 year <laughs> I marriage. Know. He says, we had an amazing 26 <laughs> years. We had an amazing 26 year marriage. Yeah. Because you didn't talk about shit. 
Yeah. Because you literally, for all these years, all, go back now and watch Be Be Real Housewives of Beverly Hills with a different lens. Remember that their relationship was just for show. It was yeah. lovely. I'm sure they loved each other, but I can't imagine that they seriously sat and had hard conversations about anything. They probably never talked about like childhood traumas. They probably never really talked about like her massive anxiety over everything. She probably never opened up with him about it because he was probably like, honey, you're going to be fine. Well, honey, exactly. And I think that she fine. did. And I think that what bonded them together um, is that he doesn't like conflict. Guess what? Kyle doesn't like conflict either, even though she's always in conflict. She's a conflict avoider too. It makes her so stressed out. Exactly. So I think that she would just vent to him about, you know, whatever issues there were. And he'd go, oh, I love being, come here. Everything's going to be I fine. And that was it. And it's like, I think that, by the way, I think they loved each other. And I think that mm -hmm. on, like on the surface, they did have a good relationship. Sure. But I think that people grow in different directions. And she was kind of a late bloomer, honestly. Like she was a mom at 19. And and, and in the first episode of Beverly Hills, this was also so revealing, Don. I don't know if you caught this. She talked about having daughters in the industry and how she kind of works on and off as an actor. And she said, basically, if I get pissed at someone in the industry, I just leave and have another baby. I'm like, mm. that is so weird. Mm. Like you, you have babies as revenge? Like it was just mm. such a weird way and, and I don't even know what to make of that, but you know, and then their whole storyline is that she wants a fifth baby. Um, that was in that first season. Yeah. And so and well, I, she I couldn't get babies. It. So she got dogs. Well, she got a lot of dogs. She got dogs. She got Birkins and she got <laughs> tattoos. Donna needs a love bean mug. That's so I, I do need a love bean <laughs> mug. I mean, honestly, like coffee it, shop called love bean that is the best mauricio yes so, michelle that's yeah. a genius. genius well honestly it's gonna open before something about her <laughs> like love bean is a, a, like the idea just came out of mauricio is already opening it on ventura i truly oh, believe is. you know and i i was talking to my friend valerie about the shout out valerie she listens and i was like why do i like mauricio so much more watching this than i did for this last season of Beverly Hills, I thought he just looked like such a deer in headlights this last season. We talked about it so much. And the truth is, it's like, okay, number one is he's executive producer, obviously. Exactly. Number two, he is being vulnerable, which I think is really, really welcomed. I mean, we did not get a lot of vulnerability, like authentic vul vulnerability from her on None. that show. And I really believe like he wanted this marriage to work. Did he fuck up? A hundred percent. But I think he was probably under the impression that like, I've done it. It works. She knows we're good. Let's not talk about it. And not, let's not ruffle any feathers with the love bean and we'll be fine. Just keep getting on a jet and keep buying homes and let her keep buying dogs and everything will be okay. But like she has said enough. She said enough and I'm out, but you're right. She is the villain in the, in the situation. If it came out that she and Morgan were together. So she needs to wait until this marriage really ends, which now apparently she's gotten divorce attorneys. We'll have to see. She's going to have to wait until that ends. And then I think af after that, oh yeah. And Anne Marie says in the uh, uh, chat and Kimo Sabi, the hats, she's a collector. Yeah. Oh my God. The chemo. I cannot deal with her wearing a hat all the time. It makes me. Maybe she's in, balding. I mean, it could. I, she has the most incredible hair I've ever seen. She's always had gorgeous hair. And it's not even extent. I mean, I'm sure there's some, but she's, she has legitimately gorgeous hair. But I will say that. Um, I well, do Laura has a, has a question oh, yeah. and being that you're a producer. This is an interesting thing. She says, if Mo is executive producer, is it possible that he is skewing the narrative? I haven't watched the show yet, but everything I'm hearing is just opposite of what impressions I have about him from Real Housewives of Beverly Hills. So my gut really fast and then I want to hear yours. I know. And let's be freaking honest. This show, it's in the same vein as Selling Sunset. If you watch a show like that, you know, yes, a lot of this is produced scenes. There's no way that everything happened exactly the way it did. There's a reason cameras show up in certain scenes. There's a reason that there's, you know, call times for these people. Hey, we've got to tell a story. So yes, I do believe that that's the case. But I also do feel a genuine likability from him in this season that reminds me of seasons one through you know, 12 of Real Housewives of Beverly Hills that we did not get this last season. So I don't know where that shifted. What are your thoughts on that? 
Yeah, I mean, I I always loved Mo. Like I, up until when he laughed at uh, Erica cursing out Garcelle's son, that, that kind of put the nail in the coffin for me on Mo. But before that, I was a huge like huge crush on Mo, and like just thought he was the best and so, so likable and so friendly and so oh fun. My God. And he was the hottest house husband. But that's not just his looks; like he was exactly so likable on the show yeah. for so long. And then we saw this other side of him last. So that makes me think, like, how much Kyle has control over the narrative oh. on that Beverly Hills show, right? I mean, a million percent. Uh -huh. And that made me so angry. But I did realize that, I mean, this was loud and clear watching the season of Beverly, of buying Beverly Hills, which is that they can't say that he cheated because he's the owner of the agency. They have kids that work for like the, I, I get why they're not talking about that. And Kyle said at that dinner, she's like, there are some things even just private between us. Totally get it. And, and you shouldn't have to. And we, we get it. You said he did something to break my trust. Like that's enough for me. Um, and it makes sense that if we did find out he was some cheating scoundrel, like confirmation of that, like it's going to affect his business potentially. And yeah. the legacy he's leaving for his children. Like I understand the stakes are really big there, but they somehow were able to present it in a way on this show in real time that felt good. Like it felt satisfying. Yeah. Us, you know, and whereas yeah. on Beverly Hills, it made our heads explode because we were being told 50 different stories at once in the scene where Kyle's crying to Erica. Nobody cheated. It's not like that. And then that comes out, I think in the same episode. Yeah. At the end of that episode, the finale, she's like, he basically cheated. Like what? So, yeah. We felt like we were just getting spun in circles over on the real housewives and then buying Beverly Hills within 10 episodes. <laughs> we basically got the whole like layout narrative. of the ups and the downs. And I, and I really, I mean, I really, I root for them as a couple watching it because I feel so sad that that family dynamic is going to change for the girls. Like I really like those girls and I like, I, I just, I, I feel for them. But at the end of the day, now it's like Kyle, it's like Kyle step up to the plate. If you're getting back on the next season of Real Housewives, which I think we can guarantee she'll be back next season, you gotta like step up. We got to get m way more. And I would imagine Bravo and hopefully your friend Alex Baskin has a conversation with Kyle that's like, you can't beat around the bush anymore on the shows. There's well, the, too much out there. I mean, the fact that they let her bring Kathy onto the reunion as a shield is just indicative of the power that she holds on that show. And that really Dude. throws me off. Right? Dude. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, the fact that Kathy was there, and we talked about this at length, but it just really was hard to watch. It really, it does, it just see, you see a whole different side of Kyle. And you really realize the fact is when they're sitting there with their daughters talking about the fact that she has to go back and reshoot or pick up cameras for the scandal about her marriage breaking up. And Portia, her youngest daughter, 15 year old, goes, Oh my God. <laughs> that was okay, funny. she goes, oh my God. And Kyle goes, what? Did something come out in the press? And Portia goes, no, I have summer reading. Kyle's like, don't scare me that way. I thought it was about, like, she's basically saying, like, what now is about me? The, they, she needs to get her head out of her ass in this, in this like time of her life like she, and focus on these kids again. So you have to understand the scene that they shot in Aspen talking about their marriage, talking about how there's the scandal coming out and Farrah's like, can you try harder to maybe work out? Like what's happening? Here? Okay. Do you think Farrah is angry at Kyle? Farrah comes off a little bit um, frustrated with her mom in a lot of these scenes and I get it a hundred percent. I think I would be too. Yeah. I, it's so hard to know with Farrah. I find her fascinating because she's clearly, and I did watch season one, but I don't remember it of course, but I, Farrah's clearly going through her own stuff. Right. So she's reeling from. Wait, trying wait, 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 we need to talk about the fact that Farrah's fiance didn't shoot one episode. I know. What's really? up with that? Obviously, as you guys know, Farrah and her fiance got engaged season one of buying Beverly Hills. And then now have called off the wedding, uh, the engagement. We find out in the end of the second season, but the entire season, she's unhappy. She's not living with him and he's not on one episode. Like he was like done with her. Yeah, what he, happened? I think he just didn't want to be on TV. Farrah reminds me so much of Nikki in Paris. 
They have the exact same way that they talk. Mannerisms. Yes. The exact same way of like that sort of monotone dis distance way of being very controlled, very contained, more like Nikki. Like Farah doesn't let her hair down. I mean, she's very controlled. And she seems, she seems honestly like I just this is gonna sound so crazy, but like, <laughs> you know, when you live with anxiety, like it's they say it like starts in your gut. Yeah. Like I just feel like those Richards, like all of them are just like their guts are like just very off. Like they're all it's just so anxious, constant anxious. Well, and I think there's a shock of facade. I think that Farah and Sophia are very shy. And I and what and I think that they don't really want to be on TV. Alexi is like Mauricio. She's a natural extrovert. She needs a stylist, but that's, I just needed to say it. I'm so sorry. Um, I think she's but cute. She's but I get lot adorable, saying. but with that hair topped on the head with that silky outfit, I'm like, Alexia, you're 28. <laughs> Stop. You're not, a, you're not 60 years old in, in Palm beach. Yeah. Um, right. It was a very sort of like, uh, like a older country club social life vibe. But anyway, yeah. I think that, um, and I don't know about Portia. She was a, a very like uh, actory when she was little, like cute, like show, you know, like, but I don't know what she's like now. She's like a teenager. So. No one does, including right. Kyle. <laughs> <laughs> Kyle's like, I forgot I had one more. Shoot. Um, anyway, so I think that Farah, actually Kyle describes herself as shy. So I think that Sophia and Farah are introverts. Um, and I think Kyle and Nikki are too, actually. Yeah. I mean, sorry, um, Nikki and Paris are also. It's like I, everything's against their will. Like Kyle was put into TV when she was couldn't even speak yet. Like everything has been against their will and thrust into this showbiz world. And Kyle has been doing it so long that she adjusted to it. But I don't think that any of them truly want to be in the spotlight. I really don't. Sorry, unpopular opinion. I think that they like the fact that they have now, I mean, listen, they've walked into their careers. They're, they're going to be successful for the rest of their lives because of their dad and mom's, you yeah. know, kind of know that. them in. But, and I think that now that they have their own show, maybe it's more fun if they were just the daughters on Beverly, Real Housewives of Beverly Hills, it would have been more unhappy, but it sucks because you're right. Like they didn't really have a choice in the matter. There's no way that one of the daughters was like, I'm not going to do it. I mean, it's like, call it the Kardashians. Now it's the Umanskis. It's all the same. It's all these sibling shows, whatever. We can talk about this for 17 years, but just for the sake of time. And do you have a heart out? No, I'm good. Okay, let's talk for a little bit, you guys. I I mean, literally, I know, I already know the comments are going to be like, you spent so long on buying Beverly did. Hills. But it's not about buying Beverly Hills. It's about the Kyle Mauricio dynamic that is just so incredible. I'm going to talk more about buying Beverly Hills as the week goes on because there's so much good stuff to talk about in that show. I found it incredibly watchable and fun to watch. Um, let's hit up just the the finale of Potomac that happened last night and then some casting news. So apparently, as of today, Candace is definitely out of the next season of Real Housewives of Potomac. She has left Candace Dillard Bassett. Bassett Dillard? Dillard What's Bassett. Dillard, yeah, okay. Chris Bassett. That's right. So she's out and it's alleged that Robin Dixon is also going to be out of next season. Are you happy, sad, anything? I love Candace. Me too. I, with I'm flaw, devastated. Flaws and all. I, she is an iconic housewife. Beyond. I cannot believe it. I actually thought, I knew she was done, but I actually thought she would just stay for her career. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm shocked. And mm -hmm. if, from the little that I read before we got on, it seems like it was her choice, which, you know, it might have been like a you and Giselle have to. Uh, my guess is like you and Giselle have to work out your issues. And if you can't, you got to go. And she's like, I got to go. Like, I do not think she is capable. And I don't honestly blame her for forgiving Giselle for what she did last season. Ra uh, Robin. <laughs> I mean, the thing is like Robin still has her moments and I can't help. Like I, there were a couple of moments even in this episode where it's like, I used to love Robin and I think she's hilarious. So she's, I mean, she, I'm not upset that she's leaving. If she wasn't in the episode, I wouldn't notice that she's not in the episode. So it's not like she makes such a mark, but she's always had her place. But the one thing, every time I see one now, it's like, Oh, I just, uh, I can't. Robin to I me, can't. You know how they say that there's like good people on TV. Candace to me is an example of someone that is oh incredibly God. polarizing and very, very, she can be very, you know, uh, mean. She can say really mean things. She fights a lot. I 
for her her confessionals like she's so good she just has and she's so beautiful to look at her style and her voice so i i am sad about the candace robin to me is like <laughs> paint dry Carl. Robin and Carl Radke <laughs> are the same type of Carl. character. Like they're just boring to watch. Robin to me does not, even when Robin gets heightened and like activated, <laughs> okay. it does not, it doesn't feel like exciting to watch. It's she, she always seems like she's sleepy. She's like tired. She needs like a little bit of coffee. Well, maybe that whole season she's going to get out of bed. You're holding it against her for Robin. No, there's but just I mean, something the, about Robin that she's just with like, Juan. I mean, she did not earn her what is Potomac? Not a peach. What is Potomac? What do they get on Potomac? Uh, isn't it? Isn't it like a, a bridge? Jula? Isn't it like <laughs> a drink? It's a mojito. No, it's not a mojito. That's no, Miami. that's Miami. No, what? It's somebody, somebody tell us. Somebody tell someone us. Will tell us. Someone will tell us. Okay. So anyway, um, okay. Obviously, there's this big, you know, crazy fight that happened at the fashion show the week before with um, Candace and another one of the friends who she keeps calling Sesame Street, which cracks me up. Cookie Laura monster. says, I think it's a cherry blossom. That's so random. Oh, like maybe. a tree. Well, that's because DC and the cherry blossom. Okay. Well, that makes sense. Um, but this last episode I think is really focused champagne. <laughs> what? Michelle says they get a bottle of melatonin. <laughs> <laughs> I think that, um, I think that in my, my feeling is that, you know, the whole Mia Gordon thing kind of took over the end of the show. They cut the end of the show at like at, at minute 40 when they show like, next, you know, Giselle ended up doing this and Robin ended up doing this. And then they come back three yeah. months later or a month later, Mia and Gordon break up. Why am I the only one that like is not surprised <laughs> or care? <laughs> Am I the only one? Like, did you really care or were you really like, oh my the God? The only, no, the only thing that was, I would literally went, oh my God, was when she said, I don't know if my son is yours. I was like, what the hell? How? Oh my gosh, thank you for bringing this up. <laughs> that was the only thing I couldn't believe that hadn't leaked. And I did a jaw drop on that one. Yeah, the whole rest of the fight, I was like, all right, these two are so weird. But well, so that one, I was like, marriage. They yeah, have an open that's marriage. That's why it wasn't right. She's like, she's known. So that was, although I, I do love watching like a real fight and seeing like what they're trying to hide and what they're not. So that was interesting. But again, show us that like every, I could have done a whole season of them fighting. That would have been great. Not them it in therapy. So, and, and the but, conversation about is Jeremiah, your son just like came, came and went. Like it was not even like a big thing. She was like, I said that he may not be his. Okay. And we've never had a paternity test. Wait, by the way, did you watch the reunion um, coming up at the reunion? I didn't see the trailer. I oh know someone God. posted it. Okay, but so she's in her dressing room, Mia, on FaceTime with Ink. And she and Gordon comes up from behind. She's like, Gordon, say hi to Ink. He's like, hey, Ink. I'm like, this is the craziest thing ever. This well, the, the fact that he said he had issues with his prostate and he wasn't able to deliver in the bedroom and just kind of gave her free reign to go F another guy. And she was doing that when they just got married. Yeah, I don't understand. I guess she did marry him for the money. And then that quickly went south. So maybe they just, she stayed with him for the kids as long as she was getting it on the side. I don't know. She's always like, I think she's a great housewife too, but like, she's never exactly been the reliable narrator. No. So, and I, I mean, yeah. there's something about, listen, Mia's, Mia's great. I, I think if, if anyone goes, we wanted, we wanted Robin to go. I think a lot of us felt like Giselle, it's time to go too. And Ashley, I would be totally fine if Ashley, I, Giselle and Robin left. I am so mad at Ashley. I I have I have not liked Ashley from honestly first season. Like to me, she's always been so lame. And then she kind of redeemed herself for a couple seasons. And then I mean, Michael is the hardest pill to swallow. Uh, oh, and another thing that came up in the reunion trailer: how she <laughs> you're gonna throw up? I, she I already am. She massages Michael's feet every night. First of all, why are they together every night? Second what? of all. Ugh. I, I want to vomit for I know. so I many reasons. Picture. He is vile. He's the most. He's really. Disgusting. He's really he's one of the worse hardest. Than people Jim to look at. I'm sorry. I'm worse than that guy on New Jersey who was on for like two seasons. The lawyer Louis. Guy. No, the, no one's. Even Louis is more palatable than Michael. We need to do a list of like <laughs> the worst. You know, like the love connection or whatever. When the dating game, when it's like door one, door two, door three. That for, for anyone that's like a little older, will will remember this reference. And we need to put like Louis, Michael, and maybe like one Jim Bellino. Like that's a yeah. good one, or someone else, Shane, uh, Shane <laughs> Slade, Smiley, or whatever. We put them all behind doors, and then we decide. It's like. 
instead of F Mary and kill, it would be like F no, kill like and kill. KKK. <laughs> no, I can't say that. It would be kill, kill, kill. <laughs> you can't say three Ks. Um, I feel like, I feel like it's really honestly, uh, Ashley is, is, you know what she just reminds me of is just vanilla. She's just vanilla to me. She's not that. Yeah, but she's so met transparently messy. Like her bringing on cookie monster, like, Oh, I'm really sorry. You guys, like I, I realize now, like I, I shouldn't have done it, but like, she's just a friend of mine. Like, shut up, Ashley. I know you brought her on. And I'm not saying the producers for whatever reason, didn't think it was a good idea, even though none of us care. Like that's the thing. None of us care. Legitimately. This was a horrendous season. And I it was, a, was it my was favorite awful. franchise. Season. I used to love this franchise. I know. I mean, and that's why the reunion, the finale aired last night and someone, uh, you know, DM me like, did you watch? It was so good. And I was like, shit, I'm two episodes behind. <laughs> I literally forgot to watch it. And then also I want to remind you guys, Summer House, Martha's Vineyard started last night. So we will talk about that tomorrow. I will, because you guys should watch it. I, I love to, Martha's I Vineyard. I had to catch up on the last couple episodes of season one. I kind of like through that. Season one was fantastic. It's, it's a sleeper good. show. It's a sleeper show. Love it's a it. really good show. Yeah. So we'll talk about that tomorrow. I mean, Potomac in general does need a cast shakeup. It does need something new. Um, they need some new new blood on there. And I'm so sick of that same. We needed to get rid of the Candace and Robin, like can't be in the same room situation. It's like enough. I hope they also get rid of NECA. I'm sorry. She just bugs. Like I could care less about her and her IUI and like, uh, you know, all of that situation. Wendy, of course, is a, Wendy's a star. So like Wendy, if no, I keep Eddie, have, keep Eddie, just Eddie. <laughs> I, he's my new friend. He's the new Mauricio. I Are you gonna, love Eddie. Happy Eddie. Are you going to watch <laughs> Wendy's um, show, her talk show? I mean, wait, the fact that she put $50,000 into that, Donna, I can't. Well, that's, that's 50 remember? on top of the 20 that she had already spent. <laughs> Can't. That should cost $10. I'm sorry. Stop. Where is she putting all that money? I, it's so upsetting the way that she chases these stupid things. Like, I, I can't tell you. And the fact that Eddie goes along with it, it's unhinged. He's so happy. He's just like, um, sure, honey, here's a check. So I think as long as we have Karen and since we let, I mean, Karen and Candace were my girls. So now we just have Karen that I like. Well, Karen is my favorite. I've said this on before. She's the best. She's the goat. Yeah, me. but let's see what happens now after the DUI. Like, that's another thing oh, is she does that. not come off very well because she lied about this DUI. Like, she didn't come clean about it when she she announced that she had it. And she should have just said, like, I don't know, it's weird. It's a weird game to play to not, like, just be upfront about the reality and just pretend it's like I was sad about my mom dying. <laughs> I know. So, that was I tough. love how she said with Mother's Day coming up, like, girl, that's in three months. Stop. I know. Speaking of Mother's Day, there was a not Mother's Day, but Mother's. I did want to like shout out Giselle's little scenes with mm. her daughters when she was sending them to college. I don't. I never talked about it on the show. That little like montage. I don't know. I just was so touched by it. The fact that you know they she's developed such a strong relationship with girls and it's so hard mother daughter relationships and they get along so well and they really respect her. I loved that. Those girls are the most incredible girls, forget on Bravo, like anywhere. They are, good. So whenever, and I think people have said this before, but it's like whenever you're frustrated with Giselle or think she's messy with whatever, like look at those girls who she has raised single-handedly basically. And that's a testament to Giselle. I'm sorry. They no, are incredible girls. I know, I know. Michelle says I have like 15, 14 years until I sent my daughter <laughs> to college and I was still sobbing Robin watching that. Yeah, no, I sobbed Rob every, I was sobbing Robin through all of those scenes. Anytime it's about your kids, like forget it, I'm a done person. And so her dad is, dying too, that broke I know, that's because devastating because she was so close. And her but, dad, by the way, do you remember her dad's iconic scene when she one? was back together with Jamal and he had the hot mic moment? where he mm. went to the bathroom and he's like, what is this nonsense with this guy? Like, he is amazing. He nailed oh, it. Oh, I know. I so know. actually, Giselle does have the vulnerability yes. piece I that Robin Giselle. lacks. Yeah. So I'm okay with Giselle staying. Okay, so anyway, Real House has a Potomac finale. And then, of course, we'll have reunion season. I think it's a two-part. Maybe it's a three-part. I don't know. It better I not be it's not a three-part. I pray. I know. It really should just be a two-part. So, um, okay. Okay. Uh, just let's talk for like five minutes because I got some tea about um, Luann's show on Friday. Now, night. This yeah. is, you teased that at the beginning, no clue what you're talking about. I'm so excited. 
Luann, so this is for all you Jeff and Heather fans. So Luann oh. and Luann had her show here at the Will Turn on Friday night. Okay. I'm not naming any of my sources, but I got sources, y'all. I got some sources. So a lot of you guys noticed that Jeff Lewis was sitting with Heather McDonald in the audience, which was shocking because if you're part of this world whatsoever, you know that the biggest, most famous like, podcast feud is the Jeff and Heather feud from last year over Earring Gate, right? <laughs> now, mind you, also Brandy and Julie were with Heather. They're very close still. And Brandy and Julie have a huge feud with Jeff Lewis because they got fired from Sirius. And there was like a lot of drama around that. This has all been months and months of a feud going on. And if you know, you definitely know how much this has been like in our world, right? So in the audience is Jeff on, and Heather. On the other side of Heather is Julie and Brandy, which is just shocking on its own that they're in the same space, not even the same room, but on the same row next, to, next to each other. And then on the other side of Jeff is your girl, Crystal Minkoff <laughs> and Heather Dubrow, which is also surprising to everyone because Jeff and Heather Dubrow had some beef before. Yeah, but, but they're he, good now. Yeah, they've well, been he had good. beef with Crystal too, but he's, right. he's clear. <laughs> I mean, listen, Jeff has beef. With Jeff is yeah, is like Taco know. Bell. Where's the beef? Like, what's the sh what's the restaurant? About yeah, beef? Wendy's. Is Jeff Wendy's? is a he started he has shit with everyone, but he, absolutely. But one thing Jeff can do really well, and I talked about this with Zach Peter too, is he apologizes. Yeah. He knows how to apologize. And so, okay, he went to this show, and he went to dinner with Luann and I'm sorry, not Luann, um, with. Heather Dubrow and with Crystal Minkoff and then some other friends and stuff. They went to dinner before. Then they get to the show and they meet up with Kristen Takeman and they meet up with um, this other girl who used to do Heather's uh, production. She used to be Heather's producer, but she does social media for like, her name's Annie. So she does uh, social media for like all these big um you know, like just, I think she does Justin Martindale's and Kristen Takeman's and maybe chefs do. I don't know. <laughs> I could be off on this, but I know she works. She does a really good job. Okay. So then apparently she, at the end of the show, the next day, I did not subscribe and I have no idea, but I know Heather released a very expensive, like higher tier <laughs> Patreon talking about it. And Allegedly, the story was that Jeff apologized to Heather wow. and wanted to go out to lunch. That's what everyone was saying online. But I guess the story was that that did not happen. Holy moly. <laughs> that they did start to have a conversation. So basically, they got put in the same row by Luann because they are all VIP. They got put in the same row. And then... What happened was um, right at intermission, Jeff was like, I'm out of here. Like I'm sitting with other people because it was not comfortable. I think they had to dialogue, yeah, like have dialogue, but they were already sitting down. And then Heather showed up with Brandy and Julie. This is from my sources. Why didn't he just there. switch seats with Crystal? That's crazy to me. But, like, why didn't he just immediately yeah, he just swat? Like Crystal wouldn't care. I don't know. That's yeah, I don't know. I have no idea. I mean, I wasn't there. Like, this is just what I've heard. Yeah. So I guess at the after party, there was like, Lots of alcohol being drank and a couple of weird interactions that I heard about involving the social media girl who used to work with Heather oh and Jeff God. and then Heather and all of that. And I'm not going to get into so much detail about what specifically happened, but it was very like shocking to the people in the in the vicinity. I heard this from two different people and um, and he never he even though she i guess said that he apologized apparently he never really did apologize but then she talked about him and compared him to Truman Capote <laughs> and his swans uh huh and so he was like f this like i'm not yeah like enough like she she went right to patreon with the story and he got upset about that or like he got offended by that and he said she'll never change and so friendship is i guess Dunzo is apparently from what I've heard from what I've heard. So tell me you guys, if you've heard differently, I'm sure everyone has a different story, but I have two people who have corroborated that wow. story. And I'm just confirming that nothing new has come up in my DMS from it. But, um, did he talk he, about it on his show today? I don't think he talked about it. I didn't listen to his show, but he had Sarah Colonna 
on his show as a guest, which you guys know about um, Sarah Colonna was, you know, Heather McDonald's girl. And so now all of a sudden she's on Jeff's show and then Justin Martindale did the after show. So it's a little he crazy. Lo he loves to stick it to Heather by doing that too. Honestly, it's so messy. The whole thing is so messy. I just like watching at arm's distance and right. then getting the tea from people. But yeah, I, I feel bad that, um, that my, that, you know, her old producer got kind of caught in the fire of all of it. So, uh, wow. Wow. What wow, would you wow. rather, would you rather be friends with someone who's going to be mean to you or talk shit about you or hurt you and then apologize or someone that, and we'll do that over and over or someone that just is mean to you. And then just, you'll never be friends with again. I just, I have an antenna for people like Jeff and I just run, run, run away from them. Because, from people like Jeff. Yeah. And Heather. They're both yeah. two sides of the same kind. Sorry. Toxic narcissist. However, I do find Jeff extremely entertaining. I don't find Heather entertaining. Sorry. I know that's going to start a whole brawl in the. Daily well, have community. them come after you and not me. I mean, <laughs> Guys, put once. all of your hate on me. Be no, nice this to is Donna. This is a public service announcement. This she is like Mauricio. This is Mauricio and Kyle because I could be like, well, at least you're having an affair now and not me. For one, like, at least they will talk shit about Aliza Rosen and not me. Finally, um, for once, I thank look, you. Ask Mark Ward. <laughs> I will tell you this. I will tell you this. It is a. They are two the most polarizing people in the podcasting radio space that oh I've ever seen in my life, and their fans are rabid, either really intense fans or really intense haters. So it's really interesting to kind of just talk about them. But but the, I cannot not talk about Jeff and Heather because know, this is what I love to like gossip about and learn about. So I want to talk about it forever. I know. It's good stuff. It's good oh my gosh. Stuff. Okay. So this was a really long episode. You were like, we'll be be done by 12. I'm like, no, I know. Well, I moved, um, I moved my, my appointment to four just cause I knew we could, I mean, we could honestly talk for three more hours, but we least. gotta let the people have lunch and go to the bathroom. And, I need to eat and, right? and go to the bathroom and listen to <laughs> queen of the con. So where can they find uh, you, Aliza? So on Instagram, I'm, uh, my name at a Y R media, which is my company name. You can go to our website too, to see the other stuff that we produce and we do. And I am on Twitter, but I don't really, I just kind of repost, you know, I just kind you of, you just like, send me stuff. Yeah. I just send you stuff. I just, you know, I don't, I'm not really active in that way. So the best way to find out about stuff that we're doing is through my Instagram. And then Queen of the Con, new Queen episode of the Con, every week. Please subscribe and listen. I hope you guys like this season. We're super excited about it. And uh, we got other really fun stuff in the works too. Yay. I can't wait to listen, you guys. Thank you so much, Dosers, for this supersized episode. Um, and we'll be talking about so much more this week. Love you guys. Have an amazing rest of your... That sounds like Mauricio. Have an amazing, amazing. 26 years of marriage. <laughs> amazing rest of your Monday. Bye, guys.